The 6.5 is on the road at IBM Think 2024 in Boston. This event has been awesome, and not only from the amount of people here, but from the content. It's, it's amazing. What we're seeing here at IBM Think is a pretty good representation of my conversations that I've had with enterprises, and that is in 2023, there was a lot of build out and construction. And that's not to say there isn't build out in infrastructure and software and uh, putting down the placemat, but clients are seeing real benefits of AI, enterprises and also consumers. And to break this down, I have Rob and Dario, 6'5 veterans, great to see you guys. Patrick, good to be with you again. Yeah, last time we chatted, I think, was in Austin. Uh, we chatted out in Yorktown together. That's right. This is great. We're regulars, we no, love it. Exactly, <laughs> no, and we appreciate that. So. <laughs> Um, in the run-up, I talked a little bit about this transition, and not that we're not continuing to build, but we're starting to see enterprises see benefits from their investments that, that they've been making uh, ongoing. And, I, and I'm curious, Robin, this is for you. Generally speaking, how are you helping to shepherd clients uh, along this path? Let's go back in time. We announced Watson X in May. And it was probably the perfect moment because everybody was excited about generative AI, but nothing had been delivered for B2B at that stage. Generally available a couple months later. We are working with clients and partners in every country in which IBM operates. Yeah. And there's a lot of patterns in what we see. People are thinking about, how do I get an ROI from generative AI? That goes to use cases like customer service, digital labor, code. A lot of people also want to play with models. Yes. We've made announcements this week around open sourcing our granite models. This is about making technology more accessible. We want to unleash a decade or more of innovation. I think we're doing the right things in IBM to enable that. Yeah, it's been great to see. And again, as analysts, I always need to watch when I pick who was first, right? But congratulations, you had the first end-to-end -end generative AI platform with Watson. And I went through all the spreadsheets, the features, the countries, uh, and, and you nailed. So congratulations on that. Work's not done. Um, we've seen your assistants providing value to your clients uh, already. Now question is, how are you taking that to the next level with application level advancements? So let's go back to what is Watson X. We have Watson X AI which is the builder studio, train tune models, work with our open source models, work with our partners like Meta, Mistral. We have Watson X Data, which is an open data store, data lake house for AI, and we have governance. Clients that moved to want more from the line of business said, we need an assistant. We need something that's packaged up large language models. That's why right. we've delivered this whole line of Watson X assistants. We've got Watson X assistant for customer service, Watson X Orchestrate, we all have over 1,000 skills, automated skills to do work for you inside of Orchestrate. We announced the assistant builder this week, so now any company can build right. their own assistant. This has been an incredible time of innovation, and we can start to see how clients, partners are using it. It's very good. No, it is very good, and the, and the, the speed of innovation is, is amazing here. So, Dario, saw you on a couple stages uh, today. Uh, uh, like I said in the green room here, appreciate the way that you make hard things to understand easier. So thank, thank you for that. I think your clients appreciate that. One of the challenges that clients are having is moving from uh, POCs, experiments, to delivering enterprise value at scale. Can you talk us through how you are doing that, how you intend to do that? So typically when you do a proof of concept and we've seen that generative AI is quite capable, you get in situations where eventually if you hone it properly, you find the right use case. But then when you want to be able to scale, you encounter issues with like trust. Okay, I prove it over here, but do I have all the rights? Do I have the right transparency, for example, of the models right. that I want to use? Uh, is the cost right? 
maybe I did a <laughs> proof of concept with a trillion parameter model, looks fantastic, but if I want to scale it to 50,000 employees, it's going to cost me a fortune. Can I do this more cost efficiently? So what we are addressing with our strategy is to go squarely at all of those constraints to allow them to scale in ways they couldn't do before. And one has to do, and Rob alluded yeah. to, to having base models that are open source and transparent on the data sources and how they were trained. And then a methodology with which you can incrementally add skills, knowledge, and data to the models at the right cost point. So our granite models that we have released are at this sweet spot on terms of size, things ranging from three billion to 34 billion parameters. And that is the right design point that we're seeing more and more of the industry gravitate so that when you do the cost at scale of inferencing, the performance ratio and cost is like just right. Yeah, it's interesting. The the questions and the learning shift uh, almost month to month, and I remember a year ago we were discussing the need for open models, when a year ago that wasn't necessarily the discussion, and now discussions on what types of models, small models, big models, vertical models, and you know what you're doing with Instruct Labs is, is super interesting in that it, at least from my point of view, is bridging the gap between these two worlds of uh, investing you know, massive amounts of money to create your own big super model uh, versus maybe doing RAG on something, and I know you can do RAG with Instruct Lab, but where you're getting maybe 90% of where you want to go. So it's really interesting. So I don't know if this is the, uh, you know, the most important question, but with all that said of where the industry is going, why IBM? Yes. So I'll give a slightly different framing now of how to understand what's happening with AI. Because there's been so much focus right now on evaluating models and what is the right model for the right use case. But let me change the lens and look at it from a data perspective right. to answer the question of why IBM. It is interesting to see the contrast of the fact that almost all public data has made its way into a neural network, into a language model, and almost no enterprise data has made its way into it. So why right. is that? The reason for that is that because we had not yet given industry a way to safely bring their enterprise data into this new representation. Right. So why IBM is because we are the only large enterprise company that can give you the openness and the transparency and the guarantees and indemnification of the vessel that you're going to put your data in that's our granite models. Right. And two, we're the only company that is giving you an incremental methodology in Lab that allows you to add step by step in a well-engineered fashion your knowledge and skills into it. Absent those two, the best you can do is sort of interact with this model. Look at RAG. RAG is a very useful pattern. Right. But you have your data outside, the model is the only thing that it has intelligence. Right. And the data and the model are interacting arm's length, so to speak. Right. It is because of what IBM is bringing to the table that we're going to allow, for the first time ever in the industry, a path for our clients to add enterprise data safely, securely, and scalably. Yeah, data, the data conversation that I'm having with enterprises is, is immense. We spend probably half our time, and by the way, it's, the bottle, it's been the bottleneck from them scaling. So, I, I, we didn't plan this, but I'm glad to know that you're listening to your clients and you're reacting, reacting quickly. So, it's funny, they say when you get the sale, the next thing they're going to ask is, well, how can you continue to do that? And uh, Rob, I'm going to hit you with that first, which is, this is great, right? Uh, you started off strong, uh, first to market, uh, you kept adding capabilities, and again, as an analyst, we need to be careful. At first, you were the first one to push the indemnity part, okay? And then, once you pushed it, everybody in the industry uh, started to push it. How are you going to continue? How do you continue this? Can IBM continue this quarter after quarter innovation? I think the key dimension we've announced this week goes beyond what I'll call the tops down sale. Working with clients, doing POCs, doing pilots. What we're doing by embedding our open source models into Red Hat Enterprise Linux AI, this is about meeting developers where they are. Right. There are millions of kernel developers around the world that play in Linux every day. This developer-centric motion we think will define the next five years of AI. Right. Because 
tops down, things will happen, for sure. But developers, builders, is where everything actually really gets to scale in an organization. So this is a big shift in terms of investing not just tops down, but also at the developer level. We think we will see a lot of different innovation here. This is part of why, to Dario's point, bringing in Instruct Lab, that's giving developers a toolkit, a capability, that doesn't exist until right. now, which is why we've also contributed that to open source. So just so I understand this, is it that the churn uh, below, meaning some of the core technologies, is going to slow down, or have you put an abstraction layer in that can deal with potential future churn? Is it, is it one or the other? I would say maybe slightly differently. Give access to models where people want to build. Okay. and all building in companies occurs with developers. From right. there, it could go straight up to a use case that we talked about. It right. could actually become an assistant that somebody in that company decides to build. Yes. Using something like the orchestrate assistant builder. But it's really about unlocking the innovation and initiative that we see in every developer around the world. Right. By the way, on that topic, you only have to go to any university or any company around the world and the enthusiasm and passion that the technical community has to understand, contribute to AI is contagious. Right. So what we're doing by tapping into this energy is actually to give them a vehicle with which to make contributions to even the core models themselves. Right. If you look at how open innovation was happening with AI, there was models would get released sometimes, and what people would do is essentially just fork them, fork them, fork them, right? Copies and copies and copies and copies. Right. But there was not a mechanism to actually allow that community to make incremental daily contributions, like happens in open source software, to make the model better. Right. That's what InstructLab does. No matter whether the thing is big or small, you have a way to say, here is my little grain to make it better. Right. And now tapping into that energy is going to give a continuous path to innovation. Yeah, for what it's worth on Instruct Lab, you know, uh, gosh, whether it's a financial institution that I meet with, an insurance company, they all wound up kind of in this weird middle ground, which was, hey, I've got this massive model that I was trying to do something with and I'm not getting the results that I thought I would get. And then this daunting task of, how on earth do I build my own model? I can't afford That's right. to, to do this. I can't make it better incrementally, and yet, as I'm piecing this together, this sounds like what Instruct Lab is intended That's to right. do. That is exactly the intent. And, and so the two pieces that Rob talked about are essential, right? Because I'm giving you base models right. that are transparent with an Apache 2 license so that you have full rights. And if you get them through RHEL AI or through Watson X, they're fully indemnified by us. Right. So you have your building block with all the rights. And on top of that, I'm giving you Instruct Lab, which allows you to now add it and specialize it. In the fine-tuning traditional world, you have your model, you have a use case. You specialize it, and you end up with a copy to do one. Right. You have a second use case. Now you need a copy of the model. Right. You have a third use case, a third copy. With this methodology, the same capability now meets multiple of those things because you are doing it in a way that the knowledge is incremental. Right. So guys, it's been a great conversation. I got to tell you, it, it, I can't believe it's been a year uh, since it's we like were- It's like you say, it's an AI year Since though. we were in Orlando. <laughs> I like this phrase, AI years, which is more like a week long. It feels like- how fast the innovation happens. It feels like uh, it's been a lot longer than that. So guys, thank you so thank much you. for coming on. I can't wait to get a mid-year update uh, with you guys and chat, and then hopefully at Think 2025. We will be there. Thank, Thank you. you. So this is Pat, Rob, and Dario signing off here from IBM Think 2024. Tune in for more 6.5 media coverage for the entire event here. Take care and thanks for tuning in.